our Father, our fear, our forgiveness. Matthew 9, verses 6 through 8. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and glorified God, who had given such authority to men. When most people are frightened, they close their eyes. What we see appears to intensify fear. As our vision sharpens, so does the fear. Enhanced eyesight stimulates dread. This phenomena also seems to work in reverse. The clearer we are seen, the more intense the perceived danger. We feel most threatened when we feel most exposed. Exposure to piercing eyesight stimulates dread. When we encounter danger, the first response is not to see the danger, that is to cover. But the second is not to be seen by the danger or to hide. The first response is not to see. The second response is not to be seen. Humanly speaking, concealment emerges as the greatest concern when we perceive a threat. When we encounter the presence of holy and all-seeing, all-knowing God, what terrifies us is that we are seen and cannot be hidden. God sees us and we cannot find a place to hide from him. The people in this text are afraid. Afraid? In all? Why? Because in that moment, each person in that crowd realized that he, Jesus, really can see me. N not just the me I want people to see or the me I want to be, but the real me. The me I really am. Jesus clearly demonstrated that he understood the intimate thoughts of both the paralytic and the Pharisee. By now, the crowd too understood that Jesus could also see them. They now understood that they stood in the presence of one who could peer unobstructed into their very souls and see their deepest sin. Terrifying. God's holy presence terrorizes on two fronts. His unstainable holiness and his unhindered knowledge. God is holy. Yet this is only one side of the terrifying presence of God. One side involves his pure holiness and the other side concerns his piercing sight. Dealing with the fact of this holy otherness presents a huge weight in and of itself. In fact, when Old Testament writers discussed the presence of God, they discussed it in terms of its weightiness. 
Old Testament writers described the presence of God as heavy. If while in the presence of God we experience the immense weight of the Shekinah glory, that weight is made heavier still by the tremendous weight of our own guilt under his piercing eyes. The presence of God presses us to the ground while the bulk and the burden of our sins make it impossible for us to get up. It is not until we hear the precious words hover from the mouth of our Savior. Do not be afraid, my son. Your sins are forgiven. It is only then that we even dare to consider the possibility of hoping to move from our prostrated state. His hovering words lifts the sinner from the ooze of guilt and nurtures us to our feet. Until then, we have every right to know the duty to exercise self-preservation uh, in wisdom by being very afraid. We must never forget in whose presence we stand. God's piercing look simultaneously induces comfort and condemnation. His omniscient gaze makes us immediately aware of the immense distance between all that we can be and all that we are not. We do well to be afraid, but fear exhibits only one side of the coin. In considering God, we must consider His pure holiness and His piercing gaze. When considering our plight in His presence, we naturally give attention to our fear in His presence and His fatherly care. On the one hand, we are afraid, but on the other hand, he offers affirmation. Thank God we hear the salvific refrain. Do not be afraid, my daughter. Do not be afraid, my son. Your sins are forgiven. In First John 4 and 8, we are reminded that perfect love casts out fear and though now we are being seen as we really are one day we will stand in the presence of God we will see him as he is first John 3 2 what a glorious day the day when we can finally see God with holy eyes at the moment, we cannot look on God. Our sin prevents that. But one day, as we are moving from glory to glory, being transformed into the image of Christ, one day that transformation will come to its fruition and we will stand with holy eyes imputed unto us and we'll be able to view God in all of his holiness. No longer will we hide in the cleft of a rock like Moses did and see the trail end of God's presence. We will be able to look him in his face. What a glorious day. Live well, hope well.